Before I introduce uh, Douglas, um, this is being uh, live streamed on Facebook and um, any questions that you have should come in through the comments feed on the Facebook uh, page itself. My colleague John, who's at the controls, will select some of them, feed them through to me, and I'll convey them uh, to Doug here. So if there's a lot of questions, we may not get through all of them, but they still will remain in the comments feed of the Facebook. So some may be answered um, after the event itself, which will remain on Facebook and also go up onto our YouTube channel. So this is the, uh, the seventh uh, close-up event uh, that we've done uh, since this episode of coronavirus. Uh, it's a regular series of talks that we will continue with now uh, regardless. Um, and we're joined by uh, Douglas Corns, uh, Edinburgh-based photographer, who will share a selection of images uh, and stories uh, connected to them that span quite a few decades now. It coincides uh, with the publication of Glasgow 1970s, 1980s. And there we have uh, the images of the front covers right now. And these two books have been uh, published by Cafe Royal Books, who regularly publish uh, photography uh, zines and publications which fit into the canon of British documentary photography. And they've received some very good press today. There was a, a very good spread in Scotland on Sunday, a couple of weeks ago, two or three. Um, the Scotsman, uh, last Sunday there was something in The Observer also. There's the, uh, the Scotland on Sunday piece there, uh, showing quite a lot of, uh, of Doug's images. So, uh, Doug was born in 1947, uh, brought up in Inverness and started as a junior photographer in the Highland News at the very uh, tender age of 15. And since then has worked in tourism, uh, corporate and press photography, to put it very concisely, I have to say. Uh, he's been the, the sole photographic contributor in numerous books, including Guides to Japan, Paris, France, India, and New York. And his work has been published and exhibited internationally. He's received many awards, including the Bill Hearn Trophy for his outstanding contribution to Scottish tourism. He's produced portraits of Scottish cities and regions, including his publications in Edinburgh, which uh, we'll see in a second. Um, and also on Glasgow, uh, interesting portrayals of both of those main cities of Scotland. Uh, the one on Glasgow here, interestingly, has an introduction from Eddie Boyd, not the American blues pianist, but the Scottish drama writer and radio of radio and TV. A very important book is uh, Scotland Five Decades of Photographs by Douglas Corns. And it's quite unique because it captures the spirit and the culture and the traditions of uh, people in place of Scotland. Uh, and this is portrayed in both black and white and in color photography. I mean, it's really uh, bristling with decisive moments and uh, I would encourage you to try and get a hold of that book if you can, in addition to the Cafe Royal books, of course. It's an eventful journey, uh, mostly uh, fusing landscapes and people and bringing history to life. Interestingly, it's augmented by introductory chapters and captions that Doug has written that provide an abundance of fascinating information. So it's kind of combines wit and imagination, but it tells us something of Doug's approach as a photographer, but indeed as a person. It presents aspects of Scotland as it was and as it is now. And as it says in the book's flap, for the older generation it is the world they grew up in, for the younger, the world their present day is built upon. The essay in that book, which was written by Doug, 
photography is serious, everything else is fun, which its title does. Reveals his philosophy on life and photography, and it's punctuated by uh, truly quite magical moments and encounters with various people and events. Many of them are actually captured in the two Cafe Royal publications, which is largely the subject uh, of, of this evening's talk. So we'll just switch um, slide presentations now, if we, if we may, and bring Doug back up onto full screen. So uh, how are you, Doug? Very well, yeah. thanks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't recognise myself in your very good introduction. You don't? Well, it certainly, it definitely is you. I mean, there's no disputing yeah. that at all. But anyway, so, yeah. Well, yeah. It's a real privilege uh, to have you uh, with us tonight and speaking to, to the audience. So 145 people watching this. Well, that's very good, yeah. Today, which I shouldn't probably have mentioned because as far as you're concerned, you're speaking to me and John. And exactly. About anything. exactly. But if we can um, bring up that presentation, we'll kind of start at the beginning because I mentioned um, you started working at the Highland News when the age of 15. Yeah. I think um, one of the images that we will uh, kick off with uh, is indeed the image in question, which will come up any, exactly. any second or minute now, <laughs> hopefully. Uh, we'll just go full screen. Good. Now, this is uh, one of the first shots that were published at the age of 15. And uh, after, well, when I took it, I realized that apart from the image, there was nice shapes going on in composition. I mean, there's a lot of angles, the little girl with her uh, arms and the shapes, and it all came together. Uh, so I thought that was the moment I understood where I wanted to, to go in photography. But a lot of my photographs take on a life of their own and they could come back 30 years, whatnot. And uh, I've got, uh, using maybe uh, some cribs here because I've been photographing for 58 years, believe it or not. Uh, so I can't possibly remember everything. This uh, picture, uh, it's, uh, I've taken it at 15, and just lately it's been one of a series that has been accepted for the permanent collection in the National Galleries of Scotland. So I'm very proud of that picture. The other thing, the young girl expression, which is quite unique, uh, I, I came up, I met her up with her, a couple of years ago, and I said to her, do you remember this picture? She said, oh, yeah. I said, well, what? She said, I even remember what I was thinking. And I said, uh, what's that? She said, I said, oh, I bet my parents will never allow me on that uh, uh, slip wire. Uh, and that, that was it. You know, she wasn't very chuffed and not being allowed on the slip wire. That was only for boys. Uh, so it's good that this picture still lives on, uh, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, we'll have a, go on to the next one. Uh, uh, this picture in Montmartre in Paris. Uh, before I thought about or became a photographer, my childhood ambition was to be in a Paris attic as a, a painting. And uh, I was 16 when I first got to Paris. I hitchhiked and uh, I think, I can't remember where I slept, maybe a park bench for three nights. And uh, this, I didn't go for uh, the Eiffel Tower or Sacre Coeur. I was more interested in the people and I thought, if I can get a shot, not actually thinking about it, it's my way of thinking that can illustrate where you are by the people. And these this couple of guys summed up Paris to me. I've since done major guidebooks on Paris and I've still gone with this thing that 
the people are more the city than the uh, the, the famous uh, spots. Uh, we'll see what's going on. Next one, there, uh, Malcolm. <laughs> this is uh, at the age of nineteen. I went to ended up in Australia, and there I was working for commercial photographer. I, uh, then it was uh, film, and uh, I would go out the weekend and walk the streets as I've always done in cities. And there's nothing gives me more pleasure than walking about in a city with my cameras. Anyway, this was the Anzac Day in Sydney. And uh, I turned my camera on the crowd watching rather than the parade. And sometimes that's a lot more interesting because people are free when they're watching a uh, parade. And they, uh, the, the other thing is what if you go into a photograph, you notice the little boy has got medals, probably his grandfather's medals. Uh, that time would be probably from the First World War. And the, <coughs> the uh, folk, they're relating to each other, his uh, brother, uh, sister and whatnot. And to me, it's an interesting point that it's obviously a story because they're eating Smith's crisps, you know? The British brand of uh, crisps. Yeah. Look up the next one. Uh, you know, as a photographer, you're very fortunate. Most photographers meet up with personalities and you have uh, different stories to tell about them. This is uh, the great guitarist Jimmy Page, leader of Led Zeppelin, shot in. Uh, 1970s and this is a local paper shot which I went out and uh, it was protesting about pylons around his house which is Boleskine House on Loch Ness and uh, I became part of the joined the one of the people that were protesting and got to know Jimmy quite well uh, so that was interesting can we go on to the next one? Uh, yeah, I just arrived in Edinburgh and uh, I was there again, I was discovering a city walking out on a Sunday morning and uh, the, I was lived quite close to the New Haven area, which was in quite a decline, as you can see. This, thankfully, it's now been restored. Uh, maybe a wee bit too well restored, but still, it still exists. And uh, these ladies were coming out of church, uh, keeping up appearances in this Sunday best. They, uh, you know, go on, please. <laughs> uh, this is in Corfu. This picture was never published. It was just... I mean, I, when I'm, I can uh, be without my camera for a couple of days when I'm on holiday, I've got to go out shooting where I am. And uh, this, uh, where are we? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's probably from influence from magazines like Picture Post. That, uh, there was always a pile when I worked in the uh, Highland News that I would refer to. And uh, we all, I mean, when I, when I put this up on Facebook saying how I used to suffer like the wee boy up in the old that for my mother and aunt. And so many people came back at my age and say, yeah, we did too. And with a fashion for knitting, we're still doing it. <laughs> so that was uh, a, an angle I hadn't thought of. But most people, the thing is very fashionable now, especially with uh, lockdown. And once again, oh, well, it's fine, yeah. Uh, when I first came to Edinburgh, the mound had a uh, speaker's corner, which doesn't exist now. And uh, the, I really saw this guy, and he reminded me of the Karl Marx monument 
in Highgate Cemetery. Once again, it's all about composition, the shape, and even the little group in the background. They've all got their elbows out, and it's creating different shapes throughout. And the uh, anyway, it's interesting that the statue, if you know the statue, and right next to it is the uh, family grave of uh, Spencer family. So you've got Marks and Spencer. Anyway, <laughs> the, the next shot is uh, uh, on the other side was taken in the uh, uh, cemetery in Argyllshire. And the guy just reminded me of a Bergman film, uh, especially one of my favorite films is The Seven Seal. And they <clears throat> looked quite a medieval pose and could be out of any one of his medieval films. Go to the next one, please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I always have my camera with me when, and I don't walk out the door without it. Even uh, going to the post office and having my camera. And this was two little girls directly across from my front door. And they uh, just, there we uh, This photograph uh, won a, a national photographic competition. Uh, I shot in colour too, and it works in both. The, uh, the little Asian girl, I, I, our sister got in touch with me because it was published not so long ago and said that she's now a high-flying in the financial world in Zurich. So that's interesting. Next one, please. <laughs> uh, we, Jenny, and it's always said the Glasgow Wayne. This was in Stafford Street in Mary Hill. Sadly, the uh, tenements behind have been pulled down. I always thought it was a bit rash to do that. I mean, this didn't fit in with what they wanted, but they were perfectly sound buildings, in my opinion. Uh, anyway, I met up with her uh, 20 years later when she was a mother and was a delightful person. And incidentally, this was used as a postcard and it was the best top selling in Glasgow for two decades. Uh, I was probably thinking of, uh, once again, referring back to Picture Post, the great photographer, Bert Hardy, uh, took one of the best shots ever. And uh, his shots of two wee boys going around the lamppost in the garbles. Uh, could you see the next picture? Uh, yeah, the bottom one is me. It's not. <laughs> it's a dreadful shot. I mean, taken by a, a very great photographer, Alistair Devine, of the record. <laughs> I don't know whether he, she's great. And she also, this is uh, Jane at the top for the Saturday Times. Um, I mean, as you can see, she's a delightful looking person and uh, still had a great smile. Uh, so that. Uh, could we go on, please, Malcolm? Yeah, uh, this is uh, uh, Ricky DeMarco and Sean Connery. Now, Ricky is an amazing guy, and he's brought he brought so many artists and theatre people to Edinburgh. And uh, he's he, I was in the gallery. He'd actually given me a small exhibition. Which uh, and then Sean Connery came in. The fun, funny thing was there was some very a group of American girls in, and they were being very arty type and very cool. But when Sean Connery came in, we just melted. It was quite funny to see. Anyway, the uh, uh, Sean, I was at a. Uh, do during the film, Edinburgh Film Festival, and the Lord Provost presented my first Edinburgh book to Sean, who said that uh, he had the book, but he, he found it very useful for making his documentary film, Sean Connery's Edinburgh with Murray Cooker. 
And uh, anyway, it just happened that a couple of months later, I was on shooting on the set of The Highlander and got my shot and was walking across the field uh, when Sean left the set and came towards me. Oh, my goodness, what's going on? And he had his hand out and he was waving and I thought, oh, my goodness. Uh, and I, I just about put my hand up to shake his hand and uh, he walked right past me and said, hi, Hamish. There was uh, Hamish McInnes, his great friend and mountaineer was there. So anyway, that avoided a, a slightly embarrassing situation. Uh, can we go on? Yeah, Ian Hamilton Finlay, a poet, conceptual artist, uh, and they uh, had a garden temple. I mean, he was very easy to work with uh, after I'd listened to him for two hours. But uh, another interesting thing, I introduced him to a friend and artist, Keith Brockwell, and uh, who went on to work with Ian major projects, including the styles at the Glasgow uh, Festival. Yeah, I've been going now. Uh, next shot, please. Yeah, the Glasgow School of Art, uh, and uh, it's unbelievably sad what's happened to to the uh, one of the world's great buildings. The uh, quite uh, interestingly, top left hand corner is one of the Glasgow boys, uh, uh, Adrian Wisniewski. And uh, we'll go on now, uh, Malcolm. The Sari, well, the Saracens, he'd go, called it Sari, he'd uh, one of Glasgow's historic hostels. And we're back in again, the interior of Charles Ray Macintosh's masterpiece. As I say, a, a building of world import importance. I photographed. Uh, a book on Charles Ray Macintosh, and I've always been inspired by his genius. That's fine, Malcolm. Uh, <laughs> this is a show I did. I wanted one of the Force Bridge for a book I was working on, and uh, didn't want a cliched image. And the, this friend of mine, who turned out he's the oldest person, disabled person, ever to swim the channel. I remember one talk I gave and I said, the oldest person to swim the Atlantic. But <laughs> somebody said, excuse me. So that was uh, the odd mistake. Uh, I can give a bit of a laugh. Uh, now, this picture, once again, I'm talking shapes working against, uh, into each other. And his arm, the, the angle, the shape of the bridge, the cloud, it just all came together and worked out better than I could imagine. Uh, incidentally, this was November and I didn't have a wetsuit on, so uh, I used to go to quite a lot of, uh, quite an effort to get a picture, but this one's been worth it. And uh, yeah, we'll go on to the next one. Uh, yeah. I, I, I love this shot, it's uh, three generations. And uh, once again, the shapes, the expressions, it's all happening. Uh, now, the, uh, as I say, a picture can take on a life of its own. Uh, a friend was saying that they were going up to Shetland to meet her would-be future mother-in-law for the first time and said, oh, uh, any suggestions for a present? Well, I just published five decades and said, oh, take it off my book. She said, oh. So anyway, uh, I suggested my book to her. My next meeting with her uh, revealed that it was indeed the perfect present because the, this was her grandfather, her uncle, and her father in the shot, which is quite remarkable. So that went down very well. And uh, the... Uh, 
we'll go on to the next one, see what's happening. Yeah. Um, just enjoying standing, looking at the image of the Glasgow uh, uh, barbers. And of course, the, the wee boy just came out, just having his hair cut. And uh, uh, the feeling that we all had at that age when we were coming out of the bar, barber, with, he's got hairs down the back of his neck. The other thing is, you know, somebody came on to me just a couple of weeks ago about this shot and said that the, they were, the family that ran the shop were a Jewish family from the Gorbals. Um, so it's, uh, you know, they, they have a life of their own. Uh, what's the next one again? Uh, yeah, another shot, uh, Madame Doubtfire in the Edinburgh Newtown. An Edinburgh character and second-hand clothes seller whose name was used in Anne Fain's book of the same name with uh, and Robin in the adapted film. A recent concert I was at uh, with the Incredible String Band tri tribute um, with Mike Hearn. This image filled the screen at the back uh, along with stage memories for their career. I think she provided all the hippies of the 60s and 70s with their clothes. Um, and it was good to see that, that picture, but it's been used in various, various things. We'll go on again. Yeah. Uh, a shot uh, taken in, when was it? Uh, 1979. And what is interesting, this is before digital. Now, I used film, and you had to operate film then and process it, which, you know, give it a bit of grain. And in this time it worked, it, and the balance of lighting, it says the 70s, and the lighting just came from the, the canopy above. And the, this was Scotty. He was a f famous busker, and he played two flutes simultaneously. Uh, and uh, was one of the few buskers before Glasgow had a more li liberal attitude towards them. They, uh, it, by the way, it was uh, Odeon, Renfrew Street, which I'm sure people know well. And uh, it was always, because busking was illegal, <laughs> it was always in the lookout for the police who would move them on. Oh, I'll go on again, have a next one. The, uh... <clears throat> this is a very dramatic shot, and I was uh, commissioned by Scotland Sunday to do a shot of the last day of Ravenscraig, the uh, iron foundry. Uh, foundry. And I had a clue what to do. Anyway, I positioned myself and saw this guy coming along. And I must admit, I got him to walk a few times in front of the, uh, the foundry or smelter. And just the last time, the, as if like a candle in the wood, this last burst, this came out and just framed itself beautifully. Uh, and it's uh, turned out to be very dramatic. Having the, the guy, the guy was actually, he left, he worked out, it was his last day, and uh, be able to devote himself to his greyhounds. But it's still very sad, but uh, plans for redevelopment of the site uh, might be underway at last. Uh, next one. Uh, this uh, was inspired by a shot I knew as a kid in Inverness. There was a shot done in the high street and it took the uh, fire brigade, it would be horse drawn in, and 
placed it up against the uh, building in High Street, and I always thought it was a great building. And the difference, this was in um, the 70s to shooting now. I, I passed it, I looked at it, oh my goodness, a beautiful fire engine, etc. And I went and saw the fire chief, and within 10 minutes, he had all the guys out. There was no health and safety, no forms to fill out. And uh, just as about to take the shot, and I, was, I loved the way it looked and the red against the building and whatnot. He said, oh, hold it. Said, oh, my goodness. I'm not going to get the shot. And he went in and he said, we've got to have Wallace in the shot. And he came out with a carrying Wallace in the case the, the mascot has been there for about 120 years. And uh, the, uh, yeah. So next one, yeah. Another shot where, you know, digital would have made this very crisp and sharp, and I couldn't have shot about it. Once again, using film, you know, you have to upgrade it and whatnot. Uh, and the other thing is, this is the old Glasgow shop, coffee shop, uh, and uh, before all the trendy ones we have today, and the one of the rules was you had to keep wearing a hat and two you can see two little locals they're still uh, wearing a hat and the relationship between the guy in the front and the lady is obviously a very tender relationship and he was an old regular customer and the whole atmosphere of the place was like that uh, very different to Starbucks and Kona Coffee, or whatever the names are you get today. Uh, uh, next one, please. Yeah, this is the old tall bar in Kenning Park, Glasgow, late 1970s. Uh, this guy, he was uh, a regular and uh, it was published in my Glasgow book and the his friends in the bar took it to him when he was in the hospital. And it's happened a few times that uh, people in a, no, not too good a situation have been given my book because they appeared in it and it's lifted their spirits a bit. So, I mean, this is, you've just seen the, maybe the first 30 years, or well, not even that, uh, I'd say a third of my photographic life, uh, and um, so, but I was thinking about what, you know what my what I feel about photography, how I look at it, and there's many people I admire like Henry Cotty Bresson, Kertege, uh, Bill Brandt, you know uh, Bert Hardy, and one of the people that I've discovered lately is. Willie Ronis, a French photographer, and uh, he uh, summed up pretty well what I feel in my, my work, and he described his approach to photography in five words. Uh, patience, thinking, chance, form, and time. And that uh, is really what I feel it's about not every kind of photography. I mean, there's so many. I mean, there's commercial, advertising, fashion, but the kind of work that I do is what it's about. So uh, I think that's the last snap. Uh, welcome. Yep. Yep. No, wonderful shot. And someone's just uh, posted on Facebook that uh, through Los Glasgow, Nori Olsen from. Oh, yeah, I know Nori, yeah. Yeah, do you know Nori? Yeah. <laughs> he, he said that they managed to name the person in the bar. Oh, my goodness. In the bar and in, in, in that last shot. So that that's uh, that's fascinating. So um, so the pictures live on. Well, they, they always do. Uh, yeah. And they, take on, they take on new meaning. Exactly. So I hope you don't mind that I didn't 
uh, interject throughout that because there was a nice flow to it all. Oh, that's so good. That, thank you. That, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just a couple of things I'd like to mention that uh, may may have been missed out. The the first image of the girl that you took when you were fifteen. Yeah. Excuse me if I'm wrong about this, but that was the first. Uh, that was on the front page of the Highland News, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you were 15 at the time. It was on the front page of the local yeah. newspaper. I mean, what what a catalyst to uh, <laughs> to your career in photography, you know? Well, I, I think, I mean, it still lives on. I mean, it, uh, I mean, they say chance happens to the prepared mind, and it's very much. Uh, another aspect of it, how I look at photography. And this one, I recognised immediately, I took it, that I had something. And uh, it's lived on, it's uh, still as relevant today as it was, you know, 58 years ago. I have to say, it's been one of a selection of pictures that the National Galleries of Scotland has got into their permanent collection. And that means an awful lot to me. And that's, I, I want my pictures to live on and not just be the, you know, the, the moment, the time. And a lot of them do still stand up today. The, uh, yeah. Absolutely. But, um, just another note, the Jimmy Page shot, which is a wonderful shot, of course. I mean, that house that he lived in was previously owned by Alistair Crowley. Purveyor of um, let's call it white magic. But <laughs> I don't think many, many I'm maybe confused magic, but uh, <laughs> as a kid, uh, we used to pass go out for a, a, a drive around the loch from Inverness, and my mother <laughs> always said that's the house that was wicked man in the world and what. Oh. But anyway, I ended up being very friendly with the caretaker in the house. And had many a nice weekend out there, and uh, there was quite carries on related to uh, Crowley and whatnot. But uh, the uh, you know it's a tragedy that that uh, has burnt down. It was a lovely house and had a very good atmosphere in it. <laughs> but um, yeah. it's uh, I, I, they're going to rebuild it. Well, they say they are. Well, I think it's a, yeah. A, I don't know. Uh, yeah. The uh, yeah. Okay, but there's a couple of questions coming in, Doug. Uh, if that's okay, so I won't invade uh, uh, the space that's required for responses. Um, Alan Kelly, a, a regular attendee of uh, of our online events. Uh, hi, Alan is particularly curious about the shot of the swimmer. Yeah. Um, you talk about the shapes, da da da. Um, no, sorry, that's two different questions. The swimmer, the bridge in the background, he's wondering how you made that. And I'm not sure if you mentioned, were you on a boat and we know you- Oh were. no, I was, uh, I, I was just in a pair of shorts with the water up to my chest, believe it or not. And I had him doing it a few times. Uh, I didn't know, as I said, I didn't have a wetsuit. And uh, a colleague of mine passed, it was Sunday afternoon, and said, I know you go to a lot of extremes to get your shots, but it's ridiculous. Uh, mind you, there wasn't the fashion in the days that I've now called swimming. And I don't aim to take it up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, so the, uh, I mean, it's it's great when you you're taking a shot, and there's more to a shot. Once in these days, you had to wait a while. You couldn't see it immediately. You maybe wait a day and you process it. Oh, going through your film and say that one. Then you you go in with a loop and say, my God, all these things are coming together. And the, the you get a shot like that. If you get 
I'm tending to be boasting now, but if I end up with a couple of these a year, I'd be quite, I'd be delighted. And a lot of people, uh, especially on uh, Facebook, they, you know, films go up and they say, oh, this is brilliant, incredible and whatnot. But I would think, I mean, I, the handful of shots that you, you get in your career, um, people say, oh, I, I, I was over in India and I on a holiday and I came back, I got 200 great shots, you know. Well, I was in India for two months and I think I've got three. I mean, the rest were usable for the guidebook, uh, but maybe I've got three photographs, uh, but there again, maybe I'm boasting again. The, uh, and uh, I go out, I mean, like for example, there was a good fall of snow in Edinburgh the last two days. And I live beside the Dean village. I didn't want to travel too far because of the restrictions. And it was really icy, but I, I sort of struggled believe it or not, to get to various angles. I was there at eight in the morning yesterday for a couple of hours. I got a shot, but nothing happened then. I went back. So I was four hours trying to get a shot of, which looks, you know, Dean Village covered in snow. But I haven't, I, I was going to put it on the Facebook today. And I thought, no, it's not happening. It's not there. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, so, uh, yeah. Other shots, such as uh, the one at Speaker's Corner, and there was an, in that first shot that you, you talked about, it was about the shapes and just the composition, for example. And, uh, a further question has been, Andy, do you see them at the time or do they happen in retrospect? And I imagine, I imagine the photographer is seeing oh, them, yeah. but they're not really registering and then when you see them when the image comes to well, mind. I'm going to quote uh, Willie Rodney's again and he said faced with a surging crowd offering a scene constantly forming and dissolving he seeks the instant of which all lines harmonize creating a composite whole worthy of record so it's quite complex uh, if you followed it, but it really, it's, uh, I wouldn't have described it like that, but it's exactly what I feel. And you're in amongst something going on. Another point is to, uh, I don't like long lenses. I like the short lens, because I like to feel that I'm in there and I don't want to distort anything. Like a long lens can foreshorten what you're doing. And uh, most people, in the old days, you bought a camera with a standard lens and they all said, oh, what lens will I get, Doug? You know, to ask them. And I always say, well, get a semi-wide angle. And they oh, no, they want to get the big long lens because they see themselves photographing, I don't know, birds or something. But uh, I, I like uh, shooting with a, uh, semi wide angle lens and the uh, going close, and sometimes the, the people don't notice you at all. Uh, other times, the notice you get used to uh, the photographer, and then you can get the shot you want. At the moment, I, I go out with a little uh, Sony. Uh, it's got a 24 mil to 200 lens. It's quite amazing. Uh, and that's all I need. I mean, the, the times I used to get on jobs, you know, go away for a month or so, uh, like shooting in New York, and I'd go out with a minimum two bodies, about six lenses, even shooting before zoom lenses. And to go out with, uh, I mean, I could achieve it all on the, uh, a little digital, I could keep one in each pocket and walk about and, you know, I wouldn't look like a photographer, which can be, is what I don't want to look like when I go out. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I used to like getting up in the morning in, in a city and I, 
I felt uh, loading up my holsters and my bullets with my films, you know, getting all the the uh, canisters ready, quick at hand and shooting, uh, a set of filters, um, the um, and now to go out with, uh, I say, a couple of uh, digital cameras is what, what it's about. Uh, and I'd like to a question coming in there, Doug, from Liam Masterson. Uh -huh. Asking about street photography. Now, I know that's not a term you're that fond of, although no, no, no. I've done it. But um, do you think that street photography is the same importance today when everyone has a camera in their pocket all the time or on their phone? Now, I know you've got opinions of that and about that, and it's quite a broad question but any immediate observations on that question well david eustace said something very interesting to you about uh, that you know the amount of people going about with mobile phones and I, i've surrendered to that and there's you know i've used like some but in some medieval costume and a parade on the mobile phone, uh, different, that makes a shot. There's one of my shots in Edinburgh, my last Edinburgh book, which had uh, John, uh, John Byrne on on his phone, and there's a beside him is it came. I, I was photographing him. He didn't know it. He hasn't asked me about it yet, but he might not be too pleased. And somebody came out with a high court uh, uh, solicitor really grounding at him. So the two figures came together. And I mean, at the moment, the precise moment, the COVID, you're getting people with uh, masks on. And I've tried a few shots for that. And the record of the time that uh, hopefully will pass, what well, the the other thing was, I mean, I, I love looking at old photographs and you, the 50s, uh, up to the 50s, when, if you look at shots of Princess Street, everyone has got a uniform, you know, the uh, tradespeople all have their boiler suit, the bonnet, collar and tie, so you know who they are. Business people, there's st still people wearing bowler hats and kids in school uniforms and whatnot. And you can understand, you you know what, what's going on. And it, it balances. And even the cars in these days, with the lovely old Jags and Morrises, and seem to fit into the landscape and the colours. Now, uh, you don't know, I mean, by the casualness of clothes and people walking about on Prince Street, it confuses you. And sometimes you go, I mean, I look at these pictures from the 50s and I say, you know, I could go there and enjoy photographing there. I'm not going to be, but now you go, you, you go to the street and uh, it's, uh, you know, and also the shop fronts, the way they've changed. So I, I don't think it's this, uh, the world's not as nice a place as it was visually. You know, it really isn't. And it's much more difficult to, to get what I'm looking for, which is a balance and a harmony. And uh, this is where, you know, the shots of picture post uh, was my uh, starting point for photographs. Yeah, well, you, you certainly don't see many men of a certain age wearing the same trousers that Sean Connery had on. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting, yeah. Uh, that's for sure. And, uh, someone has commented upon that, uh, Jan Williams, who's with us again tonight. Yeah. But just in relation to street photography or uh, shooting in public and such like, and uh, this is a kind of really difficult subject and contestable or debatable. And it's got to do with the ethics of street photography and such like. Someone who's doing an ME is asking about uh, Sophia Conte, about do you get consent uh, when you do them? But if I can just comment, 
Yes, you can get consent when you construct a photograph or you stop someone and ask them to take their photograph. But generally, and I guess this relates to some of the photographs you took, did you get consent? I get, now, I know that I, some people, would, you've you revisited the people. Yeah. But anyways. Most, most of the time on. I get the picture and then ask for consent. But I've got the picture in the bag. Like, yeah, but it depends on the situation. When I was out shooting yesterday, there was a, a whole Asian family out and they were cleaning the street. Uh, they all had a big brush and they were cleaning the snow off the street. And uh, I went up and said, look, can I photograph you? Oh, yeah. And within, you know, it took about five minutes to get a shot Then they had forgotten I was there and they got into a shape and whatnot, uh, which made a quite a pleasing shot. But, uh, you know, that aspect, I mean, uh, the, uh, the law is very confusing. I mean, children are something on their own, you know, when you photograph them, you've got to respect that. But, uh, you know, in places like France, people own themselves, you know, and you can't just go up and uh, the, uh, I, 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 I I photographed, uh, you know, a whole group of people, maybe about 20, 30 people outside a pub in a, a little island somewhere and uh, having, having a drink, just a very wide shot. And uh, a couple of people came up and got very heavy. I just said, oh, I'm sorry, you feel that way. But uh, that's it. And, uh, you know, I think... There is, I mean, I, I'm not uh, uh, very happy with, I, I wouldn't want to be, uh, what do you call the people that snatch people like you know, a paparazzi. And uh, I wouldn't want to take advantage of people. I think that if you're taking somebody from the worst aspect of how they look, that's wrong. For me, and. I would uh, always want to compliment people and make them look uh, the, the best. And uh, it's, it is a, a, quite a, um, uh, an area that we're going into that I have nobody fully worked it out. I mean, talk about um, yesterday coming back from a shot that was uh, in front of the one of the galleries, a lovely slope, and there's uh, lots of kids sledging. And I thought, no, I'm not going to bother. I just walked on because you know you totally they're just shooting, and the kids are tiny in the photograph, and the mothers look at you and what are you oh, no. um, It's quite a sad uh, situation we're in because some of the greatest shots are of kids and the, uh, especially Cartier Bresson's shots of the wee boy in Paris carrying the, the two wine bottles and being chuffed that he's allowed out to do the shopping and he's entrusted with these two big wine bottles. And it's just a superb shot. And I think yeah. these shots have gone now. And once again, also kids are not out playing in the street. Uh, so you don't, the street photography, so-called, is uh, a very different uh, thing altogether now. That's right. Uh, the image of the of the kid with the two bottles, I mean, that was just an instant. Yeah. I mean, that is the basic moment, isn't, isn't it? it? Yeah. If you don't grab it, if you don't grab it then it, it's kind of gone. Uh, Craig Atkinson, who's the publisher of Cafe Royal Books, is... Is, uh, is in attendance tonight and this is an interesting one that uh, I know that I've discussed with other photographers it's like when you shoot on assignment or when you're out shooting uh, do you shoot for the moment or for the future is there something at work in your mind that uh, you might be thinking this is going to be kind of useful for uh, future history books I'm sorry if I misrepresent your question here, Craig. But Craig says, when you made this work, did you consider its future value, historic social value, I mean? 
No, uh, no, it is. Because uh, you shoot I, from the moment, I, don't you? I, I mean, there's no. Uh, uh, what do you call it? But anyway, no. When I'm working on like the last Edinburgh book, I mean, some of it was it was called uh, what was it called? Uh, <laughs> Personal view of Edinburgh, which was right from my first day in Edinburgh to up until. Uh, it was published, and I had an idea in my head of how it was going to go, and I I had to photograph all the aspects of what I thought uh, was pertinent to Edinburgh. And uh, the funny thing was, I had it laid out, and then with my editor Claire Crawford, uh, who's I've worked with for the past fifty years and uh, a very brilliant editor she said no we're gonna have it as a walk we're gonna be at the castle that's gonna be a walk through edinburgh and she got out the map of the city and said this is the way i walk so it actually was what it was about and it, it worked very well and uh that's where but as far as you know i'm too busy getting the, the shot to think of anything it's about getting the shape, getting the person, and to think of anything uh, beyond that. No, I, it's uh, the, uh, yeah. Yeah, is, I think it was Duano quoting on people again. He said, uh, photographers aren't very bright, but they've got to be able to look backwards, uh, upside down, you know? And you're, you're not conscious that you have and maybe an ability to not look at the photograph the right way and you can look at it from long angles at the same time. Maybe it comes into uh, you know the amount of time you've been photographing or it's a um, uh, God-given uh, something. <laughs> uh, anyway, no, I, I don't think uh, I... Uh, think that deeply I mean I'm just panicking about getting the shot and uh, I see it maybe a billboard and uh, I think oh my goodness that'd be great if a couple of nuns walk past that in the shape and the form and uh, I did I've, I was at Toe Cross uh, uh, when the Pope last Pope to visit and I, I knew the Pope would be coming but I didn't know I could get a snap with all the rather risky things, you know, the strip clubs, and, and I got a shot of the Pope mobile going across, and that's magic. Uh, but then I had no opinion on it, uh, of what it would do, but uh, uh, quite often I stand, I see a fantastic background, it could be a poster or something, uh, something's got to happen. And at the moment, just outside my gate, there's three skeletons, uh, advertising the present exhibition and they're really dramatic against the wall and every time I pass I, I think yeah and uh, I've gotten near to it and one that I may never get what I want but it's there and the the other thing is quite often I, I see something and I say oh yeah that's going to make a great background for something and uh, I leave it and say, and you know, you miss it. It's when you go, it's been painted over or something. So I'm yeah, quite, yeah, uh, I missed a few shots. But uh, yeah. what is what is the big shot that you missed? What's the one that you regret? Uh, one that I regret? Well, I, in fact, it, it, there's so many. I mean, I can. Uh, but if we can go back to childhood, and uh, it may be something that formed me as a photographer. And this was in Inverness when I was about nine. And the image is always in my mind, one of the greatest images that I've ever seen. And my father took me to his office in the high street, and we're looking at waiting for a circus parade. And uh, I mean, I'm animal, very much animal rights. And, I don't approve of animals performing. Anyway, visually, it was wonderful. The elephants came and the giraffe and the zebra. 
And then suddenly around the corner, Billy Smart was in a big uh, uh, Landau, taking up the whole back, white suit, big steps, and lying back, laughing his head off, fantastic, and a big cigar, being pulled by four white horses with amazing plumes. I went, this is it. I've never seen anything so wonderful in my life. And I think that would have been a great shot. Uh, uh, the other thing that, uh, I, that probably helped me uh, way of seeing things was the uh, scene in Jaws Rock when Elvis against the uh, scaffolding and using the chair to dance with. I mean, that I've never seen a, a, a rock video that's come near that. And, you know, every time I, I see it, I just think this is wonderful. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but you're saying, what is the big shot that I want? You must. <laughs> well, uh, it's because I, I never had a camera. And yeah. uh, uh, when I was, another time I was about nine years old, I uh, went out with my mother for a picnic on the set of Loch Ness. The Arkwright Castle, and the uh, this hump appeared in the water, solid hump, about eight foot long, and we didn't have a camera, and we watched it for about ten minutes with a terrific wash behind it. It's one that is an image that has been seen, and uh, the uh, I, I was at the Highland News office, and uh, it's. Uh, one of the reporters asked the editor, Ray McKenzie, he said, Ray, I'm looking for the Loch Ness Monster. And he said, I'm looking the L for Loch Ness Monster, M for Monster, M for this. What the hell is it uh, uh, filed under? And Ray said, said, P, of course. He said, what do you mean, P? P. And uh, uh, he told me, he said, well, um, Ray said, well, P for phenomenon, you know, and that is great. Uh, to, so I, I, I'm, I think it is a phenomenon that I saw with my own eyes, and it is I saw the the hump, and uh, it was very solid. It was a mile out in the water, beautiful day, and so I, I I'm not, I think I, I'm a bit aghast at people that totally didn't deny it after the evidence is there. So it's still, I mean, I don't know what it is or what it could be, but there is an object that appears and there's enough photographic evidence. The one with the neck is absolute nonsense. We know that. No, that's interesting. That's interesting. I haven't heard that story from you before. I haven't heard that story from you before, but it's interesting that you relate that back. You were nine years old at the time. Yeah. You wish you had had a camera. Now that's the, you know whatever camera that might have been at the time. It would have been prior to Kodak Instamatic. Oh, would have been a wee... that's great. I mean that answers the question in in many ways, and I'm glad you managed to reference the the Elvis Presley uh, connection there and there as exactly. well. You know, absolutely fantastic. There's a few uh, comments I'd like to uh, share with you from people. That have sent these in, Doug, if that's okay. Um, sure. Susan Begbie, she says, Hi from your old, uh, your old Scottish Tourist Board employee, yeah. if you remember. I remember you know, Susan, Susan well, yeah. Uh, Stuart Bagley says, Selling your book in John Smith's bookshop in St. Vincent Street as a student inspired me and my photography. Recently took it to my mum, who's in a care home uh, yeah. in Newcastle, to remind her. Of Glasgow, and we both remember it as as exactly as as I grew up. Um, other comments here. Uh, Jenny Michael Bland, a gentleman photographer. Values of respect and dignity worth remembering. I don't know Who's she Jenny talking was. about? Uh, <laughs> I presume it's you. <laughs> she might be watching something else on another I think screen. Must have been. I think it's you. Yeah. 
I'm sure yeah. there was a, a few other comments that I can mention here. Uh, but um, we'll probably bring it to a close, uh, Doug, unless there's other things that you'd like to, to, to bring in at this point. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, one of the best compliments I ever got was a, uh, a friend saying that looking at my first Edinburgh and Glasgow books that uh, it was like 11 year old going through the city in the top deck of a bus uh, which I'm still I'm still 11 year old going through the top deck of a bus I always go to the top deck and get to the front and have my camera ready yeah so <laughs> But, uh, I understand that. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly what the book uh, Five Decades is really like. You can go on a circular route around uh, Glasgow or Edinburgh, exactly. sitting in one place looking at that book. And that's why the Cafe Royal books are so important to yeah. bring back some of these images to, to even more people. So well done on you and Craig for for bringing those ones yeah, in. Yeah, I mean, uh, those two. So yeah. Craig, what he's doing is very important, keeping documentary photography alive and putting you know, the work forward of uh, our sort of genre of photography, uh, which isn't always uh, appreciated. And uh, I think uh, one of the best things I heard at an opening of a photographic college uh, diploma show was uh, the uh, speaker, a well-known photographer <laughs> who I've forgotten, but he said to his students, first thing to do is ask yourself, why do you want to be a photographer before you uh, take it up? Because it's a, it's a great life. I mean, I couldn't think of any better life. And, we don't want our clients to know how much we enjoy the job. Uh, they might not be very quick with our payments, but anyway, the uh, <laughs> it uh, it can be very hard and very lonely. And uh, I've been in very dangerous situations. I've been mugged twice, and uh, you know sometimes when I've been attacked by a troop of monkeys on a cliff's edge in India. Etc. I could go on and I'll keep on saying, you know, beam me up, Scotty. Uh, yeah. But I've survived it. And uh, the, um, you know, it's, it, uh, it's the best way in my eyes to make a living. Uh, yeah. And I've had, I still love it. And I, I only think I'm annoyed at is that I can't climb out the top of buildings and rocks and whatnot. I get halfway up and they go, bloody hell, you know, am I going to get down from here? So that is the, the only problem at the moment. But uh, I may have to find another view, but anyway, I love photography. Yeah. No, and thank you, absolutely. Malcolm. And Incredible. thank you, I thank you, Craig. And I think yeah, all photographers owe a bit of a debt to people like yourself and Craig, uh, keeping photographer going and giving us, uh, you know, showcasing us, which is quite amazing. I mean, I, I never underestimate people that uh, will give time to photographers. Uh, so yeah. anyway, thank well, there's you. Many. There, there's several organisations doing doing similar yeah. uh, in ways, but we'll probably... Uh, Leave it, leave it there at the moment. Except to say that there will be a a six-page feature in the Sunday Times a week on Sunday. That's well, I, I hope they promised me it, but I hope yeah. so. So it would be and great if, if it does. So, as soon as we know that's the case, we will share it and photography network be, Scotland that'll, platform. That would be magic. We, but as you know, um, uh, news can change. About, yeah. Uh, climbing up buildings or getting beaten up or attacked by a, a gang of monkeys. I think you've just got to watch the ice out there at the moment, right? That's the most dangerous thing. Right? I tell you, you Going know. Out know in the <laughs> Honestly, it's treacherous, right? I tell you, is it the same in Glasgow? <laughs> I'll not ask you either. Yeah. 
you know, what one photograph would you wish to be remembered for? Because I know that that's such an unfair question, but it was one early question that came in there from someone. But if you're on Facebook, you are on Facebook, uh, if you have the inclination at some point tomorrow or whatever, you can have a look at the comments and the questions that have gone through. And if you felt like uh, answering any of them, uh, please do so. But uh, thanks for that, Paul, uh, in any case. So, Doug, thank you again. Mm -hmm. And thanks to your assistant, Mark, there mm -hmm. behind the scenes as well. Uh, it's been wonderful to hear all of this and uh, we look forward to more. So just to tell everyone, look up the links that have been shared in Facebook there to, to, um, to purchase the Cafe Royal books and look up what else is on their, their roster of uh, fairly substantial publications so far. Again, you can look up uh, Doug's uh, publications uh, online. You'll, still, you'll be able to find them. So we we'll look forward to more, Doug, and again, thank you very much and uh, good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you and welcome.